Hi everyone. <laughs> I can't believe I actually figured out how to turn this on. Um, Spaces Arts Lunch by Signature Theater. I'm Francis Jew. Hi everyone. I played Doik in um, the Signature Theater's production of Lauren Yee's Cambodian Rock Band. We were in the middle of our um, extension week when um, suddenly we had to shut down because of the pandemic. Um, but that means that we get to meet here, which is all great. Um, in the next half hour, I'm going to chat with not one, but two different um, uh, signature, uh, signature theater resident playwrights, both of whom are really special to me, David Henry Huang and Lauren Yi. Now, I first met David in 1989 when I became the new understudy in And Butterfly on Broadway, uh, when Alec Mappa, the brilliant Alec Mappa, um, took over the role of Butterfly for the Tony Award winning B.D. Wong. Uh, and since then we've worked on a number of other shows including Soft Power, which is nominated this season, um, uh, Kung Fu, which was done at the Signature Theater, and um, Yellow Face, for which I played David's father. Um, I met Lauren, uh, I guess, what, four or five years ago when I first started working with her on her play, King of the Yees, um, where I also play her father. So I've played the father of both of these playwrights today. I have so many questions for them. So, and I hope that you do too. So please keep commenting uh, as you are doing and um, uh, uh, ask uh, questions. Uh, let me know what questions you have for David or Lauren and I, will prom I promise to get to as many of them as I can. Um, in the meantime, uh, I have... David waiting on hold. So I am going to play a little bit of music. This is your chance to write for your own people. That's the brilliant Conrad Rickamora. Not Chinese. And see if I can actually hook David up. Hold on. Your father was from Shanghai. My father. My father was strong. He was tough, Oops. full of pride. He turned his back on his past as he tried to America, to be free in America. So at home we spoke English. Hi. Hey, David. I can't believe I actually got this to work. Francis, you're such a tech whiz. Okay, that's enough of listening to me. Shanghai has changed. It's never enough of listening to you, Francis. <laughs> How are you? How are you doing? You know, I mean, place? yeah, decent. I mean, you know, more fortunate than a lot of people. Yeah, your your family is with you, right? Um, for them, uh, well, our daughter is home. Uh, she's from she's back from college because. She's a freshman, um, and they closed down. Uh, but our son, who's older, is sheltering with his girlfriend's family in Salem, Massachusetts. And we like her, and we like them, but of course we miss him. Oh, that's great. Um, did, you, did you bring something for lunch? Um, I have some coffee, because I don't usually, I don't eat a lot of lunch. I did have breakfast today, so that's good. Oh my God, are you an early riser? I mean, I feel like I'm on the same schedule that I usually, uh, you know, that I was before we all, were all sheltering, which is I get down to my office around nine or, you know, around nine, I start writing, and then I usually write until one or two and then do meetings, although obviously today I'm interrupting to, um, to do this with you. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, when they asked me to do this, they said, who do you want to talk to? And you were the first thing that came out of my mouth. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, we've known each other for a long time. As you've said, we've worked together a lot. And it's fun for me to have, be, you, know, have you being the one to ask the questions. 
<laughs> well, um, speaking of the pandemic and schedules and stuff like that, I wondered whether um, you've, it, it has changed your way of writing or what you are focusing on writing about at all. I mean, you know, in a way, it's not that different for writers, at least the writing part, because, um, you know, the New York Times published this chart, uh, maybe about five or six weeks ago now, um, about like professions and how they're uh, vulnerable to uh, the getting the, the disease. And writers were like down in the lower left hand corner next to loggers. You know, so if I was chopping down trees, I would be like, <laughs> but, but of course, because I'm a playwright, um, it's a different story and I miss, you know, I'm usually out, I'm usually going to the theater, I'm usually not on Zoom for meetings and um, Zoom is kind of tiring. Yeah, I've been on As Zoom. As you, know, you know, I mean, you're on constant Kimbo meetings. Kimbo and Roxanne shut down constant meetings with equity and with the funds and stuff like that. Um, it's been like the busiest work stoppage I, 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 I never imagined. Um, yeah. uh, I, 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 so doing things like this actually helped remind me that I'm an actor. <laughs> um, uh, we have a question already from Brittany Diani, um, who wonders whether you prefer to work on plays or musicals. Wow. Um, I mean, plays were the first uh, stage form that I, did for many years, and it wasn't really until the until, well, this century, which now is a while ago, but um, you know, I'm old, so um, that I started to do musicals, and I think because I was um, raised as a musician, my you know, I was a violinist, my mother was a pianist, my sister is a cellist, um, I'm comfortable around music, so I've ended up being involved with musicals and operas too. And I, I just, um, I like the theatricality of that. That said, um, I do want to get back to a play now. And, but I'm sure I'll want to do something mm -hmm. strange with the form of the play like I usually do and try to bring in some other theatrical forms. Mm. You know, I think the first, um, well, first of all, let me say, I really, I'm anxious to see your opera of Anne Butterfly. That just, I, I'm, I'm, my mind is blown about the possibilities with that. And, um, but I think, you know, when I was growing up and was never thinking that this was going to be something that I did for a living, uh, the first play that I read of yours, and it was because my um, high school drama, the English language teacher um, gave it to me, uh, was uh, your FOB. And it, it really just kind of blew my mind that we could have our own perspective and that you, you were writing um, uh, in, in such a, a form-defying kind of way that I, I'd never read anything like that before. Um, and honestly, I don't even know whether at the time I understood any of it. It was, it was but it, it really, uh, but it felt like it was coming from me. And, and so even way back then, I, I really felt a real connection to how you were writing. Well, thanks. And, um, you know, you're, um, even though you've played my dad, you're younger than I am. So um, we, we <laughs> so, I mean, that was a play, yeah, still, I mean, that was a play that, um, you know, that I wrote to be done in my dorm in college. And I was also, just the other night, I was watching a movie that came out just around the same time Chan is Missing, uh, which was Wayne Wang's picture, um, with my daughter Love for her Asian movie. American film class. Yeah. And, and you know, and it, it, both those, both these stories were like just at the beginning of starting to get, you know, some degree of mainstream attention to what Asian Americans were beginning to create. You know, I, I think it's amazing that there is even such a thing as an Asian American film class, because there was literally nothing. There was no Asian American anything when I was in college. When I was a senior, I think, a couple of teaching assistants put together um, the very first Asian American history class ever offered at Yale. 
um, and it was filled with people who didn't know that their families had been interned, had no idea, had never asked about uh, when their parents emigrated to the United States because they, as far as they were concerned, they just were American. It was, it was eye-opening for all of, all of us. Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember you know, trying to I, trying to create an Asian American. I went I went, went to um, Stanford and you know trying to kind of uh, it wasn't even a class like you, we just kind of get people together to talk about some of this stuff because the university at that point hadn't really recognized it as a class. It's amazing. Were you always sort of even from the beginning aware of being an Asian American playwright. I mean, what you, I think with soft power and, and so much of your work, you're, you're sort of on the cutting edge of um, exploring different forms and, and um, sort of breaking rules and making your own new ones. And I wondered whether, you know, being Asian American is part of that, whether you've ever resented being known as like an Asian American playwright, as opposed to just this cutting edge playwright that you are. Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, I feel like I, no, I didn't think of myself as an Asian American like through my whole life. And when I got to college and I thought, oh, I wanna start trying to write plays, I didn't think I was gonna end up writing about um, Asian or Asian American subject matter. Um, but then I took a playwriting class uh, between my junior and senior year in college with um, Sam Shepard and Maria Irene Fornes, and they taught us more to write more from our subconscious. And as that happened, I started seeing these themes appearing on the page, and I realized, oh, I'm, some part of me is really interested in this. And so being an art, becoming an artist and um, uh, acknowledging myself as an Asian American happened at the same time. That's really, that's really cool because, you know, um, my first experience was, a uh, professional experience, was in Pacific Overtures, the revival in 1984. And until then, I had done things like Oliver and My Fair Lady and Merrily We Roll Along. It, i would never done a show that was Asian focused. And, and, and even, even, even so, I was really always aware of being the Asian American in the show. And, um, uh, and, and but my first experience was in this cast of Pacific Overtures where I was surrounded by people who were in one way or another making it in this business and making it a, a big part of their lives. And so that was that was like a big revelation. But even even then, I didn't think that I was going to do this for a living at all. Um, I just I just didn't think that it was. Um, a part of my future at all. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, but I was always, always really grateful when you, you know, I, there was, you had another play published and I could read um, uh, 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 even more uh, of a specific perspective coming through that I identify yeah, and, and, with. And, and, you know, fortunately now we're able to see, I mean, there's such a proliferation of wonderful Asian American playwrights. You're about to speak to one of them. Um, but what is it? There are like five or six different shows uh, by Asian American dramatists uh, in New York this spring. I mean, unfortunately, some got closed down. It didn't happen, which is tragic. But just the, it's great to have a range of work. Uh, for a variety of reasons, including that no one author has to represent the entire race. <laughs> Which you've done for so long. Well, and not you, that, you know, you know a question not, here today. Oh, sure. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, you know, not that I wanted to, it's just that you're, that's, you know, you're the person who, the, the, the most, a recognizable face in that, you know, in that area. But please, question. Well, um, uh, uh, AA Parallel asked a question that I actually also had um, about what kind of advice you have for young playwrights, playwrights right out of school, and, and um, especially um, during 
this pandemic when all work has shut down. And I yeah, also wondered um, whether I, you had different advice for, you know, Asian American playwrights. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's obviously a very, very hard time. Um, and there are productions that are being postponed. And so the idea that, you know, some there's, there's sort of a slot when things open up. Um, to some extent, that's going to, it's, there's going to be this kind of sort of backup. So that's the, the bad side. Um, on the other hand, um, li the literary offices at various theaters around the country, um, assuming that they haven't been furloughed, um, they don't have, they, you know, they have more time now to read things. So it's not necessarily a bad time to send work out. Uh, just in terms of advice in general and to Asian American playwrights, um, you know, it's the thing that makes you unique and different and weird, that is your, that's your goal. That's your superpower as an artist, because that's, if you write something that, that comes from your own ex unique experience, only you can write that play. And I, you know, mm. ironically, it's more likely to get you attention and success and work than if you try to write something more generic. You know, I think that's such great advice. I, I think that one of the reasons why I felt so connected to Soft Power and Cambodian Rock Band and King of the Yees and Language Archive was partly because I, I wasn't always sure I was doing my job in any one of those shows. And I kept, I just kept trying to connect to um, what I had in common with those characters and with the, and my, and my own perspective on what this, what story was being told. And so it was, um, I think, uh, a, a really um, interesting experience instead of sort of planning out a performance rehearsing it to the point where it was sort of locked in stone and then repeating it. I just, I never knew what I was going to do <laughs> on any given night um, because I, I, I still have questions about these plays. And these well, roles. that's what, you know, that's what makes you exciting. And it's, and, you know, of course you are uh, doing a great job in these shows because I like you as a person, but that's not why, uh, I keep asking you to do my shows. Um, so, and then that <laughs> openness, like you understand the character, but you're also open and free to, uh, to, to go mm. with what you're, the, you're feeling that night within the construct of the character. So, and that makes for an exciting performance. That makes for real theater. Oh, thanks. Well, I know that you've got other meetings coming up, so I don't want to keep you and I'm going to see if I can get Lauren online. But, you know, the, you've done exciting theater for so long. And, um, and I'm, I'm just so happy that Soft Power um, this season um, has been nominated for a Lucille Lortel, a Drama Desk, and a Drama League Award um, uh, this season. And so congratulations. Thank you. And, you know, same for Cambodian Rock Band, which is which has been nominated for everything, and you, Francis, are double nominated uh, for, as far as I know, the Lortels and the Drama Desks. Here, and, uh, you have two nominations each, and Lauren, I love so. Please, please give her my best. I certainly will. Okay, bye Thank now. Thank you so much, David. Okay. Bye. Okay. Oh my God, David was so great. I just love him so much. I've known him for 31 years and um, uh, I, I still can't put a sentence together in front of him without, you know, gushing. Um, I'm gonna try to hook Lauren up now. And while I do that, I'm gonna play a little something for y'all.
Oh, it worked. It worked. Hello. I can't believe that this old man has yeah. been able to do his own Instagram. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to use a grand story until this year. So. I, I, literally a month ago, after Cambodian rock yeah. band shut down, I started posting stuff on Instagram and I still am very confused by it. I, I would just like repost from people because I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> you look fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I was like, I have, it's hard to see, but I was like, I got the shirt. Brilliant. Uh, I've become very homesick for like San Francisco food. I don't know if you feel this. So yeah. uh, I made a Hong Kong milk tea, which I've never done before. I'm so jealous. Um, but it was it was not too too hard to make. You need, you just need like a lot of tea. Have you um, been cooking a lot more since you've had the shelter in place? Are you becoming a pandemic chef? Oh yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> so it's like me and my husband and Zadie, who's about almost seventeen months now, Amazing. and I'm three of us. I'm the one that does the cooking. So there are there are things in my pantry that I have not used for years. <laughs> So I'm used for the first time. Uh, but I've, I've come up with quite a repertoire. And I think like now, because like I can't get dim sum, uh -huh. uh, like I'm trying to make it. Uh, <laughs> so today I have uh, Jean Doi. For, for anyone watching, it's like the sesame balls with like red bean inside. Oh, good. Uh, so and they, they're good. They're, they're like a little janky because they're flat rather than like round, but uh, we're gonna see how it works. Wow, wow. So. Well, congratulations on all of your nominations. Um, congratulations to you. And, and okay. um, for your Bay Area Theater Critics Circle win, wins um, last night as well for King of the Yees. You are you got, a you, ball. You get two? Well. There was Language Archive, and King of the Yees. Well, so. there are so many different theaters in the Bay Area, and it's so spread out that they give area awards like East Bay, mm -hmm. North Bay, San Francisco, and South Bay. Oh, nice. So you won for San Francisco, and then they give out mm -hmm. the King of the Awards, which is the entire Bay Area, and you got both of them. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's, it's also like the play in itself, like King of the Yees, it's kind of like a ringer for San Francisco because it's it's a celebration of that city. Uh -huh. And so in a way, like the, the play is, is San Francisco. Totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, I see that um, um, Moses Villarama has- Hi, Moses. Is, all, is on online with us, as well as Leah Chang, who has been so great at promoting the show yeah. and taking pictures of us. Um, uh, the Lark Play Development Center, Jessica Francis Dupes, uh, Lavina Jadwana, Ariel Estrada, Linda Chin, Workman. I, I, you, I, I just can't, I'm so uh, grateful that everyone showed up today. Uh, yeah, it's, ni it's nice to see everybody. Yeah, yeah, when we've been separated so much. Do you think that the pandemic has changed the way that you've, you, you're working now? Um, it, is, it is definitely changing it just because like we have we have a baby and so kind of probably like a lot of artist parents and just parents in general uh it's like who watches the baby and when so we've had to kind of very carefully portion out the day so like this is like my time to work and you know like in the other room is is my husband and the baby and you know like they're watching 101 dalmatians um so it's <laughs> It's, it's, it's both wonderful in that she keeps me on a schedule that like 8 a.m. it's time to wake up, you have to get out of bed, you have to make food and that there continues to be like a rhythm to the day. Mm. Then I think also at the same time, it's just, it's, it's like you have to really work to like carve out the time. I think especially for freelancers where, you know, like there is, I could not do work. Mm -hmm. I, I could just kind of let it fall. So it's kind of what is what is important enough, mm -hmm. um, and like how to create the I don't know just the, like the sense of rigor. Well, I don't. 
I feel like equ equity work may be like your baby during during the pandemic. Oh my keeps God. You, keeps it, yeah, it's been constant. Um, I hope you were listening earlier when David was talking I was. to you. And how much I love I want to like hear more. <laughs> I know. This is Go on. Um, I, you know, and I didn't say this to David, but you know, when I was doing soft power, I started getting, you know, the occasional uh, ask about, are you available and interested in doing this or doing that? And uh, mm -hmm. would you come in and audition for this? And, and I was feeling so spoiled by the experience yeah. of working on that play with mm -hmm. those people that I just, I, I just started saying no to everything. And mm -hmm. really worried that I, I had become so spoiled that I'd never work again. And then literally, the mm -hmm. after we closed Soft Power, I was yeah. asked to come in and audition for Cambodian Rock Band. And we so the week we did. Yeah. And I was like, this I will do. Yeah. So, and, and, but then again, while I was working on Cambodian Rock Band, I was like, I'm, I'm so spoiled and um, I don't ever want to work on anything else that doesn't matter this mm -hmm. much again. Have you ever felt that way? Like after writing Cambodian Rock Band say, were you like, I, I don't know what else I can do because this is, this is just it. I've, I've constantly felt that and I, and I think it's, it's tricky because it's a piece that means a lot to me that like I've lived with for a very long time mm. and kind of all, all the things that you hope for in a piece of work kind of came together with this, like kind of beyond my wildest dreams. So it's kind of like what I always, I always knew that there would be just a little bit of a drop off or just like a little, a little change of the next piece you work on, the relationship is going to be different kind of the you are a different artist at this point um and and i think that's i was like that will be okay like there will be some change i did not think the big change would be a pandemic uh i thought it would just kind of be regular life after this right um but i think i think it's like that's that's what it means to be a, a theater artist right to to kind of have these moments that you're like you're gonna have the best moment of your life on stage or writing a piece or watching it, and then you're gonna have to keep go on living, right? And if right. you can do that, you can be an artist. Right. Does it? Yeah. Do it, it, so you think that the pandemic is really gonna influence the way that you write from now on? Um, I mean, I think it'll, it'll definitely be a part of that. Um, and and I don't quite know like how how it will influence things, um, but I I think I'm in the same boat where you are, where it makes you value your time, and in a way it feels <coughs> it feels kind of selfish and spoiled to say no, I can't do this and no I can't do that. But I think sometimes those no's will help you to get to the thing that you're deeply connected to, right? And that some, sometimes you saying no to a role or, or a piece means that someone who's more right for that Absolutely. or is like in a place to do that role is going to get that opportunity. Right. It was really scary thinking about mm -hmm. auditioning for your show, even as much as I wanted to do it. Because yeah. Daisuke, Suji, just mm -hmm. like, I, I, I think is fantastic and, and mm -hmm. has been winning awards for yeah. playing the role. So I was like, uh, um, so the first thing I asked my agent when they, they told me about the audition was, why are they auditioning? Because if they're just replacing Daisuke, I don't want to even audition. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know why he's not doing the show. And so, and, and if it's really available, because I don't want, yeah. you know, just to come in and on spec, you know, the, mm -hmm. I, I just didn't want any of that juju. So they told me that he had this TV show and I was like, oh, that's great. Yeah. So he'll be making lots of money. And um, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll come in. But then even after I got the role, um, I was saying a lot of no's. Like, I can't do that. I can't talk to the audience like that. And I can't go out and dance with a cowbell. I mean, I, I can't. Yes, you can. I can't you can't dance to this song that Jane Louis is, is singing so beautifully. You know, 
tons of no's and, and um, I'm so grateful to you and to Che uh, and the whole team for, you know, keeping encouraging me to, you know, make it my own and um, also allowing me to steal as much as I possibly could from mm -hmm. what they remembered of Dice K's performance. Because um, yeah. it made me, it made me feel braver. And, and I think, I don't know, tooting your own horn, but just like, I think it's a testament to that role and how many layers are present in that character and how nuanced that character is that like Daisuke brought a lot of like incredible, memorable things. But I think at the same time, like I would watch your performance and there were just different things, like different notes, almost like a piece of music mm. that like struck me, that just struck me in a different way mm. that based on who you were and what kind of performer you were, I was like, oh, I've never quite heard this piece of music in this way. And I think I was, mm. I was really grateful that I was still like surprised for being a person who has seen this show countless times and knows it so well. Um, and you know, and I think that's a testament to like you as a performer. Well, um, it's a testament to you writing an actual human being, you know, um, so that any human being occupying that role is going to have different notes mm -hmm. because of just who they are. Um, it's, it's, it, it's the great challenge of that role because it's, I think, it's easy for an audience once they once they have pegged him as boy mm -hmm. to go. He's a monster, and yeah. So he's he's this unusual unicorn of a of a monster. He's not me, and so I can just sit sit back and judge him. But the challenge that you give to any actor in that role is is also to portray how normal he is, and and thereby mm -hmm. showing the audience how much capacity they have for the same kind of malevolence and um, violence and, and all, all of that stuff. Because mm -hmm. I think what makes Dwayne kind of extraordinary as a character is that he's not at the bottom and he's not at the top. It's not Pol Pot. It's a right. guy who is a middleman. Mm -hmm. He's in the, he did terrible things but he's like, there's people above him that he can kind of push it on to. Mm -hmm. of like, that wasn't me, that was the people above me. And those were the orders I was getting. So I, like, I just find that aspect of his character really fascinating. I think what was, what was interesting about you in that role too is that like, there were times when you were scary. Like I'm, I'm so used <laughs> to seeing you like, you know, in Yellowface or King of the Yees, or that there's there's a real openness mm. to your acting, and and I think like in in like a beautiful invitation um, and a warmth. And so, for for me, seeing you as Doik was almost it's like all the Francis do, but like slightly turned <laughs> like five degrees in like a terrifying way. Now you don't know what's the real one, right? Fun. Yeah. <laughs> I I I actually really enjoyed um, all of those aspects that I don't often get to to do. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I I did get a lot of comments from people who have seen me in other things who were like, "Yeah, this is this." I, I didn't like I didn't like seeing that that Francis. Yeah. Um, I know we're supposed to end soon, but if you want it. it it's okay to stay for just a couple more minutes. Yeah. I just yeah. want to know like how it feels having this, this planting this tent pole for yourself in New York City, your first big ass production mm -hmm. in New York City and getting a drama disc nomination and getting a drama league nomination and, you know, having, and, and just being this playwright who's worked for a long time and had mm -hmm. many plays already done and published, but now just like first play in New York, boom, here you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm I'm incredibly grateful for how it happened and the way that it happened. That signature kind of helped create just like a beautiful production, but also that we were finally able to record an album and like mm -hmm. have a piece. It out there, 
it's going to be out in a week. It's going to be out in exactly night. a week. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think also, even though we ended early, to me, it feels like we got to let it blossom in the way that it wanted to and just got really lucky in timing. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that I think we were able to have, to have this beautiful work bloom and have that we got like five Asian American nights out of it, which is, which is nuts. That's you uh, in a signature yeah. organizing all of that. That's a, that was amazing. Yeah. So I think just like incredibly grateful for that. Um, and, and not sure where we will land, but I feel like within the past like five or 10 years, there's just been such, there's just been such like a growth of like Asian American performers, just like, it almost seems like exponential that there are so many actors and writers and directors and design that I don't know well yet. And that's right. really exciting. Really exciting. Right? That, that there's not like 10, 20 people, there's hundreds. Um, and I feel like that makes me think that the work is going to go on, that, that there's kind of this generation of like artists coming up behind us who are just all so different from one another. And like that, for me, that's the reason why I think like this work will continue and will be incredibly strong. I, I'm just uh, constantly amazed these days mm -hmm. with people like Joe Martagatak and Mo mm -hmm. Villarama and Courtney Reed and Joe No, who just are these amazing skilled, yeah. skilled performers, mm -hmm. actors who are, who, for whom it's not even a question. Taking up space is not even a question. They just mm -hmm. do it. And it, yeah. it's taken me a long time to get there. Um, you yeah. have a great question from Lori Kramer, 1958, that I want to ask you in closing. Yeah. Um, it, it, she says, I really think Cambodian Rock Band would make a terrific movie. Oh. Any chance? Question mark. I, I think there's, there's always a chance of anything. <laughs> um, I think it'd be awesome to see a film. I think, I'm curious about the ways the film version kind of would take everything that's like theatrical and exciting about the stage version and kind of translate that on stage, right? Like how, like, especially the Doit character, how do oh. you take his relationship with an audience or like the warmth we feel towards him before it shifts mm -hmm. and put that in a theater? Um, I'm curious. I, that, I hadn't even thought about that. I was thinking about how great it would be to have that band you know, yeah. all that, you know, it would be a, such a rock movie um, mm -hmm. as well um, that would blow people's minds because even people I know, major musicians who came to see the show said, I know nothing about this yeah. genre and now I want to Google everything I can to find out about it. So kudos That's to you. Great. Yeah. I will say one other thing. So the other day I was just kind of Going, going on a rabbit hole, and I came across uh, Asian American Theater Company's archives, not, uh, like, I think from, like, the very, there was a page that had, like, their history all the way back up to, like, their first season in, like, you know, the mid-1970s when they started. Wow. And they listed kind of the production and the cast, and, like, to see all those names and those pioneers on there of, like, I was like, Amelia Cachapero was on there. Amy Hill was on there. Lane Nishikawa, Mark Hayashi. Yeah. Speaking of like, is missing. Totally. And I, I was just, I think I was just reminded of like how much history is and how deep these roots are. And I was like, I want to know what that was like doing, you know, a show with Asian American Theater Company in like the 70s. I think that makes so much sense. I'd love... To, mm -hmm. you know, a fly on the wall and, in a, watching a play about how they yeah. created work and carved out space for themselves at a time when there was none of the kind of celebration that there is now. Yeah. And I think uh, I was also watching uh, a movie the other day and James Hong was in there. Ah, 
um, James. the actor Dave Long, who has, I think, the most credited movie roles of any actor, like in 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 like American film history. Yeah. I was like, I want to just to put it out there in case anybody's watching. I was like, I want to see like the James Hong documentary. Yeah, me too. I think that would be amazing. It would be like a his, really long movie. Yeah. All these clips from every single movie that he ever did. That would be incredible. Yeah. I think his first, it said uh, on IMDb, his first credited movie role was, I think, in 1950, like, 56. God. It, yeah. Is Cambodian Rock Band your first album? Uh, it is. I mean, it's my first album. It's not your first oh album. God. Well, yes. Good reminder as we close, thank you very much, Lauren, that Soft Power's original cast album is now out at Ghostlight Records. And in a week from today, May 9th, Friday, the release of the Cambodian rock band original cast album um, is happening. Um, and you can uh, pre-order um, through, uh, there's a link in Signature's Instagram bio um, for pre-ordering the album. So check it out. Um, Lauren, thank you so much. This is too short, but I'm really, yeah. really happy to see you. It's been a while, but we will see yeah. each other again, I'm sure. All right. Thanks, Francis. Um, okay. I, I'm excited right. to announce, everyone, thank you, Lauren, All that right. um, next Friday um, at noon, you can take your midday break with Signature artist Crystal Dickinson and Brandon J. Dearden from Signature's production of The Piano Lesson by August Wilson. I love them both so much. And I think that they are just brilliant actors both. So I really highly recommend checking that out next week. Um, thank you again so much, David and Lauren, um, for um, visiting with us and, and putting up with my Instagram non-skills um and i just want to give my personal shout out to natasha sinha who taught me how to log on to um instagram so <laughs> she's dragging me into the century in which we are living thank you so much to natasha and to signature theater for asking me to host um i'm really really um, grateful to everyone who checked us out uh, thank you all for listening and um, uh, everyone, please take care of yourselves um, at a distance and um, we will get together again. We will. Signature is important. It matters. And um, uh, we will be together again soon. I love you all. Thank you.